Welcome to the Revelation TV debate for this evening. The subject is, has the church replaced Israel? Uh, a very emotive subject, but we have two people that I know will be discussing it uh, wonderfully well uh, on their best behaviour, as well as our audience will be tonight, won't you? That, well, they said yes. We'll see. But anyway, uh, let me welcome, please, first of all, Dr. Stephen Sizer. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Uh, Dr. Stephen Sizer spent many years uh, studying the theology, politics, and history of the Middle East and has travelled extensively throughout the region. He adapted his PhD thesis into a book, Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon. Question he, mark. Question mark. Uh, thank you. He believes that Christian Zionism plays an important and dangerous role in the politics of the Middle East, shaping US foreign policy. He argues that Christian Zionism has no biblical foundation or historical precedent. President, president. Dr. Calvin Smith, welcome to you, Calvin. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. He's principal of King's Evangelical Divinity School, editor of the Evangelical Review of Soci Society and Politics, author, academic researcher, conference and church speaker. When do you find time to come here? <laughs> uh, he lectures in theology and hermeneutics as well as researching and writing in the fields of evangelism and politics, Pentecostalism in Latin America and Christian responses to the modern state of Israel. Welcome. Uh, thank thank you. you for coming. Uh, we are going to allow them both to set the scene <coughs> in just a minute and they will have uh, approximately seven minutes each to set the scene before we develop the, tonight's debate. Um, we are going to have uh, opportunity for some in the audience to ask questions. There will be emails as well. Uh, so if you want to get uh, via email or text your comments in, we will take some of those. We won't be able to take them all, but the details will be up on the screen uh, quite regularly. Please uh, bring your comments, bring your questions in at the, that time. Um, we feel that there is going to be emotion tonight. It's an emotive debate, but it's going to be handled decently and in order. Uh, and so don't throw anything at the TV screen. Write a question instead and make a comment and we'll be glad to hear it. So I think without further ado from me, let's get straight on with it. And I'm going to hand over uh, to Dr. Calvin Smith to start and then Dr. Sizer after that. Thank All right. You, well, Doug, thanks very much for, for having me. Stephen, it's a pleasure to meet you and we've had uh, an interesting chat already and I can see we're going to have many more in the future. But what I'd like to do over the next seven minutes is just, just give you the bottom line. Uh, my bottom line is simply this. God has not finished with Israel. God retains a plan and purpose for the Jewish people as a distinct people. So what I'd like to do is to present the case for Israel. It's, it's not complex theologically, I don't think. It's very simple. Some of the verses are well known, they're well rehearsed, but uh, that's the nature of it. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that God's covenant with the Jewish people is perpetual. It's uh, irrevocable. Romans 11.1, 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. I mean, don't get more uh, specific than that. They are Israelites, Paul says in Romans chapter 9, verse 4, and to them belong, not belonged, but belong, present continuous, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises, and it says in Romans 11, 25, 26, at the end of this, uh, this, this section where Paul deals with ethnic Israel, a partial hardening has come to Israel until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel shall be saved. Now, in that passage, Paul quotes Isaiah 59, uh, verse 20, part of 21, and in that passage in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah goes on to say, this is my covenant with them, with Israel says the Lord, my spirit who is on you and my words which I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouth of your children or from the mouth of your children's children from now and forever, says the Lord. So Paul had this in mind when he's talking about the fact that God hasn't finished with Israel, that they are going to be saved eschatologically. He's referring to a, a passage that Isaiah quotes where he's talking about the perpetual nature 
of the um, covenant that he has with them. This is echoed in Jeremiah chapter 31. Are we allowed to read from our Bibles? Oh, absolutely. Good, because it wouldn't be very good if we couldn't, would it? Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37. This is what the Lord says, the one who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from my presence, this is the Lord's declaration, then also Israel's descendants will cease to be a nation before me. He's actually saying the opposite, okay? That they will always be a nation before him. This is what the Lord says. If the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below explored, I will reject all of Israel's descendants because all they have done. This is the Lord's declaration. Again, he's making the opposite point. So Paul concludes Romans 11 with this point. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage, but regarding election, they are loved because of their forefathers, since God's gracious gifts and callings are irrevocable. And it really raises an issue for us as God's people. If God can so cavalierly ditch his historical people in the way that some people suggest, then we're in real danger because we, we're God's people today. We could be ditched tomorrow. Second point I would make is that Israel is a true biblical theology theme that stretches across the whole Bible, the Old and New Testament. It's mentioned far more than any other doctrine, or many other doctrines, I should say, uh, themes like baptism and communion, for example. Israel is mentioned or alluded to around 3,000 times. God is referred to as the God of Israel. 200 times. That's a major title, God of Israel, to suddenly say God has finished with Israel, as understood in the Old Testament understanding. Israel is known as God's people. Uh, Israel is described as God's servant, God's inheritance, God's firstborn son. It's a major theme in the New Testament. We've just seen in Romans 9, 11. We're told in John 4, 22, that salvation uh, comes from the Jew, that we're to preach the gospel to the Jew first. And then in Acts chapter 1, 6 and 7, right before Jesus ascends to heaven, the disciples, the apostles come to him and they ask him and say, Lord, at this time, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. It seems eminently sensible to me that if they had it totally wrong, he would put them right. And in fact, three verses earlier, it says that he was teaching them about the kingdom for 40 days. And so for them to come uh, and to have this understanding of the kingdom, clearly uh, it relates to this issue. It's also an eschatological theme. We see Israel not just in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, but in the end times. Uh, there's a reference to uh, the 12 apostles uh, reigning, uh, sitting on 12 thrones in Matthew chapter 19, 28 and 9. How many minutes have I got? And carry up. Your okay, all right, because I wish, I wish I'd have accepted that 10 minutes now. Yeah. It's, uh, Keep going. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll give Stephen as much time as Okay. Yeah. And we find Israel in the, in the land in the last days. We don't have time to turn to these now. I'm sure we'll look at them later on, but Matthew 24, 20, Luke 21, 20 to 24, very important section. We see Israel in the land in Jerusalem during Jesus' great eschatological discourse. And there's a very good book by R. Kendall Sulin, excuse me, it's entitled The God of Israel and Christian Theology. Uh, he's no dummy, Princeton theologian when he wrote the book, and uh, he explores how the theme of Israel, ethnic national Israel, runs throughout the pages of scripture, throughout the canonical narrative, as it's called. So in conclusion, yes, the promises to Israel are extended to the nations. Yes, we are saved, uh, but not at the negation of Israel. I think that's a very important point. The extension of the promises don't preclude, they don't replace, they don't subsume, they don't abrogate Israel. And I think we've got to differentiate today between hard supersessionism, the view that God has superseded, or rather the church has superseded Israel, or soft supersessionism. It doesn't matter how it's presented. For me, they're both supersessionism. It's just that one's a lot nicer than the, the other one. And the bottom line is God has not finished with Israel. Now, in conclusion, what this does not mean, it doesn't mean for, for Christian Zionists that modern Israel is sinless. Uh, just as biblical Israel sinned, so modern Israel sins. And it's a folly, those super, super friends of Israel who are Christians to pretend Israel doesn't make mistakes. It does. 
The second thing is that uh, we reject the concept of two ways of salvation. There is only one way, uh, and that is through Christ. We reject Israel right or wrong, but we also reject Israel is always wrong. I think that's important. And I think sometimes we need to get beyond this idea that God somehow loves the Jews more than the Arabs. I think we need to differentiate between corporate Israel and individual Jews and Arabs. I think sometimes the debate doesn't take into account this nuance of the difference between Israel as a corporate entity and individual Jews. God has a plan and a calling for the Arab people. I'm uh, particularly concerned about Arab believers. And I think when Christians emphasize God's calling for the Jewish people, perhaps it's in order to also emphasize the Hagaric covenant, that God has a plan for them as sons of Abraham, who nevertheless still need Christ. And I speak as an adopted uh, son. And the very last verse I'd like to read out, because this was written, oh, 3,000 years ago, and nothing seems to have changed when you hear Iran's Mahmoud, um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, uh, or when you hear uh, Hamas or Hezbollah. Listen to what the psalmist said 3,000 years ago. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. And I think one of the fears that some Christian Zionists have is when they read that and when they see that, you know, for them, God has not finished with Israel, that he retains a plan and purpose for them, whatever that is, to then hear and then be challenged that, no, God has finished with the Jewish people completely. And actually, you know, the, the, what's going on in the Middle East is not that bad. Israel's a bad egg. I do think that makes people uneasy. And I look forward to discussing some of these issues more with you later on. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, you, he took nine minutes, so I'll be fair. You can start your nine minutes, Stephen. Please put your basic premise to us before we start The question I've got for this evening is this. Was the coming of Jesus the fulfillment or the postponement of the promises God made to Abraham? By that I mean is the church central to God's purposes today or a parenthesis to God's continuing purposes for Israel or the Jewish people? And to answer that, let me give you three other questions that I hope will give us an answer. The first is, who, who are God's chosen people? The assumption that the Jewish people are God's chosen people is deeply ingrained uh, in, in church life, and therefore to question it sounds heretical or anti-Semitic. And yet both the Hebrew and Christian scriptures insist membership of God's people is open to all races on the basis of grace through faith. For example, uh, Psalm 87, 4 to 6, I will record Rahab and Babylon among those who acknowledge me, Philistia too, Tyre along with Cush, and will say, this one was born in Zion. Indeed, of Zion it will be said, this one and that one were born in her. I will, the Lord will write in the register of the peoples, this one was born in Zion. Isaiah 56 seems to anticipate and repudiates the rise of an exclusive Israeli nationalism. Uh, Isaiah 56, let no foreigner who's bound himself to the Lord say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, who love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, for my house we call a house of prayer for all nations. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is in the Hebrew scriptures, God's people, Israel, was an inclusive term, not a racial designation. Yes, the majority were Jews, obviously, but other races were welcoming on the same basis of faith. In the New Testament, the word chosen is only used of Jesus and the followers of Jesus, Jews or, 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 um, or Gentiles. Uh, Colossians 3.11, um, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness. He's talking to Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. So that's the first question. Um, who are God's chosen people? Second question is, what is the significance of the promised land? Again, contrary to popular assumption, the scriptures insist repeatedly the land belongs to God and residence is always conditional. Leviticus 25, 23, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you, that is God's people, reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. God never gave away the freehold. 
The scriptures insist residence was open to all God's people on the basis of ra faith, not race. Indeed, um, we'll unpack this later tonight, but Hebrews uh, 11 insists that um, Abraham was looking forward to a city whose foundation, whose architect and builder is God. He wasn't looking for an earthly home. It says he was looking for, an earthly, uh, for a heavenly city. And then Hebrews 11 concludes by saying that they were commended for their faith. None of them received what was promised, since God had planned something better for us, New Testament saints, so that only together with us would they, the Hebrew saints, be made perfect, i.e. one people of God, not two. So the land was only ever intended to be a temporary residence. Yes, God may have plans for the Jewish people today in the land, but I don't find that explicit in the New Testament. Third question, does God have a separate plan for Israel apart from the church? Many believe, and, and Calvin has uh, expressed that eloquently, that God has a continuing covenant with Israel separate from the church. And that's often based on Romans 9 to 11. But if we go back in Paul's logic of Romans and begin in chapter 2, he defines a Jew as someone who is not a Jew who is someone who is only outwardly, nor a circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew, says Paul, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. So he's already defined what a Jew is in Romans 2. You get to Romans uh, 9, and he limits what he means by Israel. Romans 9, 6 to 8, it is not that God's word has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. He's narrowing down his definition of Israel. He says, because nor are they, because they are descendants, are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And tonight, I hope we're going to look at Galatians 4, where he says Gentile believers are the children of Sarah, like Isaac, and those who reject Jesus of Jewish origin are the children of Hagar, he says. We'll come to that. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul explicitly identifies the church as the true circumcision. So he's using language of circumcision to refer to Jews and Gentiles who believe in Jesus. Now, I would argue that's entirely consistent with an inclusive people of God, which we've already uh, summarized. Of course, I agree with Calvin, God has not rejected the Jewish people. His covenant purpose is for them, as with every other race, is that they may be saved, Romans 10, verse 1, to create one people for himself, made of Jews and Gentiles, Romans 11:26. His covenant purposes are fulfilled in them and us through Jesus. Very explicitly, he, Ephesians 2. He's talking to Gentiles, uncircumcised, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. He has made the two one. One people. His purpose to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. So to summarize, in the New Testament, we're told explicitly that the promises made to Abraham were fulfilled in Jesus Christ and those who acknowledge him, irrespective of their origins. God's blessings are by grace through faith, not works or race. Let me conclude with Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. And then he goes on in verses 28 and 29. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female. You are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Now, I take that as a promise that applies to me as well as my Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. We are heirs according to the promises made to Abraham through Christ alone. So, it's not an understatement to say that what's at stake is our understanding of the gospel, the centrality of the cross, the unity of the church. Does God have two peoples or one? And the nature of our missionary mandate, not least to the Jewish people. Thank you. Mm.
Uh, many, many points you, you both brought up. Uh, maybe I could begin to ask a couple of questions here. We could begin to develop this. And one of the issues that was brought up there especially was the land. Um, and we talked about the land. I, I would like to start very simply, if we could go back to a, another scripture, Genesis 13, 15, where it, 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 it actually specifically says, and I think this was something you said, Stephen, so maybe I'll come to you first of all. There it says, for all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Now, I think you said there that God gave, uh, that God, it was his land all the time. Here, he specifically seems to have given it to, uh, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. C can you maybe talk on that yeah, and come sure. back on that? Well, then? Leviticus 25 says, the land is mine, you are the foreigners and strangers. So if he's giving them the land, he's saying, I'm giving it to you, but you are the strangers and the aliens, okay? Um, let me give just a couple of examples. If you have an unconditional promise, you've just quoted one, and you add a conditional clause, you have a conditional promise. And in the Torah and in the writings of the prophets, over and over again, God gives conditional criteria for continued residence in the land. For example, uh, Jeremiah uh, 7. If you, uh, he says, reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in that place. If you really change your ways and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless and the widow, do not shed innocent blood, if you don't follow other gods, then I will let you live in this place, the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But a bit later in Gen uh, Jeremiah 17, he says, through your own fault, you'll lose the inheritance I gave you. I will enslave you to your enemies because they'd rebelled against him. And the pattern all the way through the prophets is, is obey and you can stay, rebel and you're out. It's as simple as that. And so the conditions were always there that residence was conditional. And I mean, Ezekiel 33 is a classic example. Ezekiel 33, God anticipates the arrogance of, of his people who thought they'd been given something that was theirs by right. He says, son of man, the people living in those ruins are saying, Abraham was only one man. He possessed the land. We are many. Surely the land has been given to us as our possession. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Since you eat meat with the blood still in it, you look to your idols and shed blood, should you possess the land. You rely on your sword. You do detestable things, should you possess the land. I will make the land a desolate waste, and her pride strength will come to an end. It was when they repented and acknowledged their sin, God allowed them back into the land. So it was conditional. Okay. How would you see this, Calvin, uh, this promise which I know many people would say and, and as, uh, uh, as just been Stephen said, is conditional for all the land which I give to you, I will give to your descendants forever. How do you see that and how would you respond to what okay. Stephen said? I do want to respond but I just want a point of clarification here from some, because I might have misheard. Did you say that God might have a purpose for Israel in the land today, as if you haven't made up your mind on that. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't yeah, catch I'm that. I'm still point. working on it. I hope you're still learning too. I am. I um, am. I'm trying to make sense of what God is doing today. But there is, as far as you're concerned, the possibility that God might have brought them to the land. Yes. I thought, okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. I didn't know you thought that. I think many people would be surprised to hear that. And I'm, I'm, I'm open. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, you've, ne you've not struck me as an open person on some issues, but. Um, you know, that one has certainly surprised me. Let me respond to the, the land issue. I think God has given the nation the land uh, as, as a promise, like you just read. I think it is conditional, and uh, the people have been exiled whenever they have sinned. The main question that I have to ask you is if, you know, every time they sin, they lose the land, why are they in the land now? Uh, it would seem to suggest that either God's gone back on his, on his plan or God has brought them there for a particular purpose. The other thing, and I think this is, this is worth uh, mentioning, there is a history of exoduses from the land, but there has always been a remnant within the land. And this goes right to the heart of, of Christian Zionism. I mean, you know, if, when I prepared for this debate, I am a non-supersessionist. That is my stance. I believe... Can you explain that? Yes, yes. Uh, supersessionism says that the church has superseded or replaced Israel. We, we call it replacement theology. 
I am a non-supersessionist, so I, I reject uh, replacement theology. And when I came into this debate, uh, my uh, basic argument was God hasn't finished with Israel. They will be saved at the end of time. God retains a plan and purpose. And I have to say that as I research for this, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of a non-dogmatic, semi-Christian Zionist. But I'm much more dogmatic now than I was. And I think the land is far more important uh, than, I, than I had said before. And there's always been a remnant in the land, even after the Assyrian exile in seven, I don't know, 726 BC, 586 BC, the Babylonian exile. There were remnants that stayed there. Uh, you have a remnant that came back under Zerubbabel after AD 70, uh, Titus's destruction of the, of the temple. You have uh, them leaving, part, some of them leave the land, they leave Jerusalem, the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, in the middle of the second century. But you know, there's a very good book by Moshe Gill, a uh, historian, thousand page book, it's, it's heavy going, uh, but he opens up in 634, uh, A.D. when the Muslim um, invasion took place and the Jews and Samaritans were still a majority in the land. And he traces Jews in the land right through to the Crusades. And we know that the, the, the Jews were there during the Ottoman period. And we know during the end of the Ottoman period the Jews were a majority in Jerusalem. And sometimes we get this impression that Jews came in waves from the Russian programs or whatever and actually, there's been a continuous Jewish presence in the land, a remnant in the land. I actually think that that is an important, uh, you know, an important theological case in support of Christian Zionism, that, that God has brought the people to the land, but that they've never left it in the first place. Now, there has been groups that have sinned, I mean, the nation has sinned, but that comes you know, come back to my main question. If you know, sin means that they're out of the land. Why are they there now? That's what I, you know, I, that's what I don't understand from, from your point of view. Is it possible God has brought them there? I try and be dogmatic where Scripture is clear, and therefore I'd be agnostic on what God may be doing today among the Jewish people in the land. What's very clear, I think, in Scripture is that they were to share the land. They came back out of uh, exile from Babylon and Ezra and Nehemiah, and God gives very explicit instructions in Ezekiel 47, you are to distribute the land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel, mm -hmm. conceded. You are to lot it as an inheritance for yourselves, conceded, and for the foreigners residing among you and who have children. Absolutely. You are to consider them as native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe the foreigner resides, you are to give them their inheritance. So the land must be shared with people of faith, okay. not on the basis of race. I've tried to show okay. when we define Israel in the Hebrew Scriptures, we're dealing with the people of God are not a racial, uh, a narrowly defined people group based on race. Okay. Can I respond to that? Sir? Please do. Sure. There's two things that I'd say. Uh, I, I agree completely there were non-Jews uh, within Old Testament Israel. But we never hear the rest of the story when people bring out this argument. Yes, uh, aliens were permitted. They were all aliens. No, no, no. But I'm talking, I'm talking after they were called, the house of Israel was called, given the inheritance of the land. You have referred to passages where the aliens were permitted No, I'm to saying have... God called the Jews the aliens okay. and tenants. All right, but you still, and, and you, you've said it in, in many of your writings, you refer to the Edomites who joined, you've just referred to uh, non-Jews, the mm. point you've made is that there was a non-ethnic element. Have we got it that straight? They were regarded as equal citizens okay. of God's people. Right. The point I have is this. Yes, aliens were permitted to join the congregation of Israel. They were loved by God. And in fact, they were granted full rights and privileges. And the Bible says it, God says it over and over. And there were strict instructions laid down concerning their fair treatment. Mm. And for God, there was to be no difference between the alien and the Israelite. But there was uh, a reciprocity element. There was a kind of quid pro quo. Uh, there were conditions oh, yes. attached to that. Definitely. Inclusion meant joining the house of Israel. Mm. So they lost their identity as the nations that they belonged to, and they, to all intents and purposes, 
joined the congregation yes. of Israel. Yes. Uh, they were told to observe certain religious and other laws. Even those who participated in the Passover had to be circumcised. It says in Exodus 12, 48, 49, Numbers 9, mm. 14. There were even religious observances required of sojourners. And the land inheritance was given to them as individuals, not rival national claims. And I think I've heard this argument a few times, uh, that the verses trotted out that you've just mentioned as a basis for saying that Israel has to give the land to the Palestinians. I think there's other reasons or there's other uh, biblical things we can discuss to mm. discuss the whole issue of transfer of land to Palestinians. Well, let, let's jump 2,000 years to today. Okay. I thought we weren't going to talk politics. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. not. I'm, coming to, to, no, to. I'm coming back to scripture. Okay. I'm coming back to scripture. Right. Following your logic, I'm a Gentile. The Hebrews, uh, sorry, Romans talks about the Gentiles being grafted in. The question is, what have we been grafted into? And on what basis? Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem said, we don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to follow the law of Moses. So the criteria for membership of God's people has changed in the New Covenant. But what have we been grafted into? It sounds like you're changing the question from what we were discussing here. I'm just interested to know how the alien, having right to an inheritance that is a, a personal inheritance, mm -hmm. uh, in, in some way is a basis for saying that Israel has to share the land. That's what I'm trying to understand. You, you seem to be moving, and those are points that I'd like to discuss I'm later saying that on. they had to share the land when they came back into the land. Yeah. I'm using that as an image to show that Israel today in the New Testament is often used as a term to describe God's people, not a racial group. I've just showed you from Romans 9 mm -hmm. and uh, Romans 2 that Paul defines what he means in that language. So I'm simply asking you, what have we Gentiles been grafted into if it's not Israel? I'm look, I, I hold to the view that God has only ever had one people. It's always been on the basis of grace through faith, either looking forward to the coming of a Messiah or looking forward to his return. Not on the basis of race, one people of God. But it was on the basis of race to a degree, wasn't it? I mean... Can, can I just bring something else yes, in here, which, which I think develops this? I, and, and we'll be going in, in a while to uh, any emails and texts, etc., and coming in. But I think bringing on to the New Testament side that, that we're developing there, maybe I, I can bring this to you first, Stephen, is one of the things that appears to happen, and we're talking about the two becoming one, and of course that is a concept that's in. The, the, the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But when you get to passages like Ephesians chapter 2, do you see that although it's talking about the middle wall of partition being broken down, do you not see there that still two groups are there? H how do you see that? And how do you answer this issue that really the two have become one and therefore everybody's lost their identity. Mm. Uh, well, I'm not saying they lost their identity. We're still male or female, for example. But, what, but not Jew or Gentile? No, I'm, I, I, <laughs> no, I'm not saying Sorry, that. But I'm, that not, I'm not that saying that. It's in the that. same verse. I'm not saying yeah. that. Okay. But do we have two people of God or one? Okay, That's let, the key. Let, let's take that. How, how would you answer that? Do we have two people of God or one, or one people of God? Uh, yeah, I mean, the debate has kind of pivoted on those two polarized yes. views, one or two. I think the answer is both, <laughs> yes. in the sense that there is one people in Christ, but there is another group of people who will join that people in the future. You know, there's people now who are walking this earth who are not saved. I know, they will be grafted but, back in. No, no, I'm not talking about Jews, I'm talking okay. about Gentiles. Right. So the Gentiles walk in this earth right now that are not saved, mm. but one day they will be saved. So they will join mm -hmm. uh, the people of God, as it right. were. And exactly the same with the Jews. Yes. The one day there will be a national awakening of the That's Jewish nation. That's what we nation. pray for. Okay. But 
do you really see that? Do you really see, see uh, th that there will be a national awakening, that there will be a, a revival of the Jews, that God will bring them to a knowledge of his Messiah? Zechariah 12, 10, one day they will look upon him. I pray for that. No, 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 I didn't ask you if you pray for it. I said, do you accept it? Well, I wouldn't pray for it if I didn't accept it. Okay. But I draw but a distinction. But Okay. Okay. Go on. I draw Sorry. a distinction. You use the word national. I see, I see you know... In Britain, people often think if they're British, they must be Christian. Mm -hmm. And we know that we all come to the foot of the cross as individuals. And I would say the same for our Jewish friends who have yet to recognize Jesus. So they're no Jesus. different from anybody else. No, in I'm terms not saying of that. I'm not saying that. Romans 11 gives us a list of what they have, what the benefits they have. I'm saying that they nevertheless come as individuals to recognize Jesus mm -hmm. as their Messiah. But, there are no but, grandchildren in heaven. No, but we're not, to, this is what I said at the very beginning, we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about Israel as a corporate entity. Okay. We're talking about all Israel, a phrase that appears okay. over and over again in the scripture, which well, refers- Well, once all Israel will be saved. And I would hold that if we have been grafted in as Gentiles, what mm -hmm. have we been grafted into? Well, Jesus says, I am the vine. He's quoted from Isaiah 5 where God says Israel is the vine. Jesus, and, and I'm pleased with your book, we're both supersessionists. We believe that Jesus has, su <laughs> you said it, Jesus has superseded, Jesus supersedes the old covenant. And I agree, amen. Jesus is the one through whom. What's that got to do with Israel? Well, you talked Just about Jesus the remnant. Jesus' sacrifice no, supersede the Old Testament sacrifice. He fulfilled it. Hang on. You, That's got nothing to you, do you with Israel. You refer to the Israel remnant, issue. okay? Let me ask you this. When Christ died on the cross, how large was the remnant of Israel, faithful Israel, when Christ died on the cross? How many faithful people were there? I don't understand what you're asking. Well, okay, let's put it this way. If, if you look at like the hourglass, um, you know, the, the egg timer, you've got the promise to Abraham and the fulfillment in Revelation, the great multitude. <laughs> But when Christ died on the cross, he was Israel. We all like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So when Christ died on the cross, he was Israel. Mm. And therefore it's only through recognizing him that we are part of that remnant in whatever generation we're living. Do you see? So when Christ died on the cross, he was the remnant. But the, the, the remnant idea is, only takes us to the end of Romans 9. God, uh, Paul makes clear that the remnant is at this present time. There's more to come. Yes, the remnant is, in, 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 I think in, in Romans, uh, if we're dealing exclusively with the Jewish remnant, those who've recognized Jesus. I, I'm, I'm going to hold You're this You're going to have a heart attack, so No, no, I, I'm going <laughs> to hold this here just for a minute because I think we need to get back and we need to get back to, to the heart of this okay. and, 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 and look at it. But before we do, I want to give others the, the opportunity. So Gordon sitting patiently over there, if you can find your microphone. Uh, what has the, the airwaves uh, been saying to us at this time? Well, as you can imagine, Doug, the airwaves are pretty busy Hot. with emails <laughs> and texts that are coming in. Uh, somebody wrote in, I was just trying to find it, <laughs> Susie, and she said, um, will there be a transcript of the debate? <laughs> she imagined that somebody was going to sit down and uh, type it all up as she'd like to read it. Can we just say to, to viewers, Doug, that there's not going to be a transcript of the debate? but there will be a DVD of the debate, and uh, if people want a copy of that, they can always contact the office, and uh, we'd be pleased to um, tell you how you can obtain a copy of the debate. I think the interesting thing is that so many people are asking questions, and uh, what's, what's being said, in fact, is raising more questions and actually answering them. So what I'd like to do is just give you a, a little favor of, of some of the questions that are being asked. Um, David said, if God has canceled or if Israel has written itself out of the Abrahamic covenant, how is it according to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 37? Mm. But the new covenant clearly made with the Jews is predicted, predicated upon the facts that verse 36, the seed of Israel continues to be a nation before me forever. Mm. Mike says, uh, does the following make sense? Jeremiah 31, 10, he who scattered Israel will gather the church. Here's another one from Liz. She says, if God has replaced Israel with the church, then who are the next people group that uh, he will cast off? That's an interesting comment, isn't it? Michael says, if the land of Israel is holy, 
And if residence there is conditional on faith and righteousness, then by what right do unbaptized believers such as Muslims have to live there? And Pastor Ben Midgley, he says, he quotes Ephesians 2.12, uh, and he says, isn't the thrust of Paul's remnant theology here and in Romans explicitly the premise that unlike all other people, the church will always have Jewish representation, and that is ratified by the covenant. Mm -hmm. I could go on. Do you want I me know. to keep going on? It I know. Just, the, the, I think the debate could keep going on for, I know. for, for hours and, we and hours. E we haven't even scratched the surface yet. Um, ma maybe um, uh, Derek. Derek McCoy. Where, where's Der Derek's? Is it, is it? Hand up. Is that Derek? No. Where's Derek? Uh, he's right here. So uh, you, I believe you have a question, Derek. Which? Yeah. It's been mentioned once. Um, by Stephen, I think about Christian Zionism as a pretty pejorative term, but myself as a Christian, I consider myself uh, a Christian Zionist as someone who's been grafted in to the vine, um, but I see a distinction there between Christians and Zion, and Zion as believers, um, Gentile believer and Israeli believer. <coughs> um, would that not be a better explanation of a Christian Zionist than, uh, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> got cold, uh, than the pejorative view that I've heard you talking about before. You sound I'm not more quite sure what your me. question was. Okay, sorry. Uh, but basically, uh, as a Christian grafted in uh, with the Israelite believers into the vine, Ro Ro Romans 11, we've talked about, would this not be a better explanation of Christian Zionism, uh, Zionism rather than the widely held uh, pejorative view that, uh, of that label? Well, the, pr the problem with terminology, it's like Israel in the church. We, we think church, we think steeple, we think building, we think nominalism, you know, denominations. Israel, we think state, we think modern nation. You know, Jesus said, um, on this rock I'll build my church, my ecclesia, my called out ones. And, and, and one of the words used in the Septuagint uh, for the synagogue is the ecclesia. So for me, the word Israel and the church in a biblical sense are interchangeable. It's not to deny God uh, having a, a, a purpose for drawing uh, the natural branches back into the, into the tree in the future, uh, into the one people of God, but his purpose is to create one people. To answer your question specifically, the problem for me with the term Christian Zionism is that it's like saying I'm, I'm a Christian conservative or, or, or a Christian um, whatever. It's, it's linking a political position with my Christian faith. I would rather say, I hope, I'm a philo-Semite. I love Jewish people. Um, that's, that's not a political term. It, it, express, it mm. expresses Christian um, compassion or mercy or grace. One of the things that's come up, and I, I would like both to discuss this, if we can, is, is, it, is this image in, in, in Romans 11 of, 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 of being grafted into the vine. Now, if a branch, i.e. the Gentiles, are grafted in, it does not alter the root. The no. root still remains. But what now, is the root? Yeah, exactly. Now, what, what are you saying, the root? And I would like you then to answer, what is this root? Okay. And, and where we are, yeah. Okay, well, for me, the, the parallels with John chapter 15. I, I don't agree with no, that. No, okay. I don't see the two are related. Okay, okay. Clearly one is a vine and one is an olive tree. Okay. Nevertheless, Jesus insists that he is the vine and you are the branches, he says. And if we uh, remain in him, we can remain in the vine. If we don't, we'll be cut off. So the... An, an can, can we come back to Romans 11? Yes, which yeah. is the same uh, analogy no, I don't think of, it is. of okay. being cut off through arrogance or being grafted in through faith. All I'm saying is that if... Let's, let's play with figures. Let's say that based on the number of messianic believers we know exist, let's, let's double it, let's triple it, let's quadruple it. It's still a small minority of Jewish people today, right? You agree with me? Okay, so if they represent the natural branches that are in, in the tree, if you like, in the vine, okay, the majority are, are not, okay? You agree with me? 
Well, I'm, I'm not going to agree with anything well, until I know where you're well, going. Well, unless, okay. <laughs> my point is well, that if the right. majority of Jewish people today are not grafted in because they have not recognized Jesus as their Messiah, they cannot be the root. The root is either historical from Abraham up, or it's, it's God himself, Jesus. And I don't mind which it is. But, the, but the, the criteria in the Scriptures in the New Testament is repeatedly, and I give you one example, um, from, uh, from, from um, Peter, Jew, speaking to Jews, Acts 3, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from... God's people, and that's the consistent warning of John the Baptist, Jesus, and the apostles. Okay. Can, can I, I, can I yeah, yeah, please. And if we can also go back to Romans okay. 11, yeah. respond to that, and then to, yeah, right. please. Yeah. I don't think, I'm not convinced uh, that Paul had uh, John 15 in mind. I think he was a brilliant scholar, I think he was a brilliant theologian, uh, and I think that just confuses the issue. Uh, you want to know what we belong to. We belong to Israel in the sense that, you know, Ephesians 2 talks about we were separated from the commonwealth mm. of Israel, now we have citizenship. Yes. Okay? All the things that were promised Israel, what is promised to Israel? All Israel shall be saved. Incorporates. That has been given to us through Christ. Through a Jewish Messiah, mm -hmm. the salvation comes from the Jew. Going back to Romans chapter 11, and this is very important. Let, let, let's just get some background here to the whole passage. Uh, bear with me, uh, but you've had a good go, and I just want a couple of three, three minutes. minutes. Okay, <laughs> all right. So Romans, Paul sets out the whole case of justification by faith. He ends at chapter 8 with this uh, you know, kind of psalm, this, this, this statement, the victory of the redeemed, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Mm -hmm. And then immediately this Jew of Jews says... But what does this mean for God's historical people? Mm. Where do they stand? And Romans is a diatribe. He's asking questions and then he's answering them. And then he comes on to Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. And that's when he deals with where does Israel stand? Now, the, the, the interesting point is this. If you just stopped at the end of chapter 9, you could say that a remnant of Jews and Gentiles are a present fulfillment of the promise to Israel, and that's the end of the story problem is Paul winds up his argument and he doesn't end at the end of chapter 9 and he doesn't end at the end of chapter 10. He actually ends at the end of chapter 11 and there he goes on to explain that wider Israel will one day accept her Messiah. Now I think what Paul was combating was the first replacementists mm. in the church. In yes. AD 49 yeah. Claudius's decree resulted in Romans, uh, sorry, Jews having to leave the city yeah of Rome. They returned in AD 54. Priscilla and Aquila, who Paul met on, yes. on, uh, in, in Corinth, I think it was, uh, they're back in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, sorry, in Rome in, uh, at the end of Romans chapter 16. But it seems while, while the Jewish believers were away, they had become arrogant, the, the Gentiles, yes. and they were disdainful of the Jews. Oh, mm. God's finished with you now, so Paul has to set the record straight. And it's a very simple statement. No, don't be arrogant towards them. He says it three times. Don't be arrogant. Don't be conceited. Yes, a remnant is saved now, but one day they will all be saved. You join them. And what I found very interesting in Romans chapter 9 is this juxtaposition, this uh, com uh, comparing and pitching against each other, different times and expressions of Israel. Notice earlier on in Romans 9, 10, and 11, we have a partial hardening, a partial uh, remnant saved at the present time, a first fruits, uh, the root, a remnant. And then later on, by the time he gets to Romans chapter 11, he's talking about the whole nation. So we have uh, a remnant, the whole nation. We have the first fruits, the whole batch. We have a few, we have the full number. All Israel will come to a knowledge of the Lord. And we, we believe that from Zechariah chapter 12. Let's turn to that. Zechariah. Can I ask you a question on that then? Certainly. Calvin, when you say all Israel, what do you mean? Do you mean all Jews that have ever lived, all Jews alive at the time Paul wrote it, or Jews arrive when Christ returns? Okay. I mean, if, I, mean? if I was going to be facetious, <laughs> I would quote my father who 
always loved to say when he was in the platform, which bit of all don't you understand? <laughs> uh, but I won't. Well, on what basis will they be saved? Okay, let me say this. If I go to Zechariah 12.10, it might answer your question. Uh, this is an eschatological passage, okay? It is, I, I would say pretty well most scholars accept there is a, this is an apocalyptic passage. Uh, then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the house of David and the residents of Jerusalem, and they will look at me whom they pierce. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly for him as one weeps for a firstborn. Fast forward to um, chapter 13, verse 1. On that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the residents of Jerusalem to wash away sin and impurity. We have this very clear imagery here of the sprinkling clean in Ezekiel chapter 36 and uh, other passages that relate to being washed clean. What all Israel means? I think it means the whole nation. Uh, it's a phrase that's used several times. I don't know if you remember the story of when uh, Absalom, Absalom uh, sought to take over, usurp his father's throne, yes. and he took his father's uh, concubine up onto the roof of the palace, and there was a tent, and he took her into the tent, and this was a clear act of usurping his father's authority and whatever, and it says, and all Israel saw this. And then we know it's, it's an impossibility that the whole nation could be at the base of that building to see it. But the concept all nation means the nation as a whole. And so again, I get back to the, the issue that I started with. I've tried to uh, you know, give us an opportunity to talk about it. You haven't taken the bait. But there is a difference between individual Jews and the Jews as a corporate nation. Whatever that is, whether it's the Jews who are alive at the end of time or or, you know, there are some people who say all Jews that have ever lived. I don't believe that. Uh, I do think that uh, we have this issue of that they have been partially hardened. And if we read in Romans chapter 11 that they've been partially hardened for our sake, some of them haven't had their chance, clearly. And so, you know, there are different points of view on that. So does God have two peoples or one? He has one people whom we have joined. Okay. We as Gentiles. We as Gentiles have joined the remnant of Jews. Yes. The problem is the rest of the nation haven't received their Messiah yet. No, but when they do, we'll still be part of the one people of God. Oh, yes, but you know what? In the uh, eschatological passages that I was reading, and this came as a surprise for me, it demonstrates just how much we're influenced by Greek thinking. I know you're going to have a heart attack, but <laughs> let, me, let me finish with this point. The, the, the nations... So, sorry, sorry, Doug. No, sorry. The, the nations, uh, you wouldn't believe I'm really nervous, would you? Uh, the, the nations still feature in the millennial period, but get this, also in eternity. So this concept of nations seems to be very important to God. I would say that's another reason why Israel has to be saved at the end of time. Yeah. Okay, we'll we come back and give okay. you some more on that. In a uh, but uh, we've got a, uh, some more <laughs> emails. Gordon's chafing at the bit there and then we'll take another question from the audience uh, as Doug, well. it's fascinating just as there's a debate going on here in the studio there's a fascinating <laughs> debate going on with viewers at home uh, they, they've got so much more they'd want to put in with their questions Absolutely. thank you so much for them um, here's somebody who tuned in a little earlier on they say just tuned in guys there's nothing quite like a good-natured kind-hearted debate blessings to you both both of you argue well so there you are that's a, a compliment <laughs> and here's someone who very succinctly puts it a you scott their name is church can't replace israel that would mean you have to replace god he meant what he says and says what he means god bless you scott and here's one which says from from caroline she thinks the problem is the use of this word replaced mm -hmm. she says concerning the debate on how on has the church replaced israel it can become confusing, but perhaps the confusion is in the actual term that is being used, i.e., has the church replaced Israel? Perhaps replaced is the wrong word to use. I'm so intrigued now to seek the Lord on this matter, because having always believed that there is no replacement at all, I'm now seeing that perhaps it is not so much about replacement as it is about um, am, um, amalgamation, perhaps. And uh, Ruth says she thinks both of you are confused. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and she's well, right. <laughs> I, what I am in the middle, I don't know. Um, Jack, Jack Moore, c can we take a question over here, Gordon? Sorry to get you off your comfortable seat there, um, because I think it's something we touched upon earlier, and I would like to uh, to get back to it. Yeah. 
Uh, I, uh, it's been mentioned two or three times, but in Jeremiah, God promises Israel will remain a nation whilst the sun and moon shine. And, uh, and in fact, mentions, uh, as opposed to the other nations, a bit, a bit later on in that passage, how can that be if the church replaces Israel? Mm. And, um, uh, but I'd like to, to add a little... Can I? Uh, can, can we just leave it there, Jack? We just don't have time, I'm sorry. Uh, but I, 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 I think the thing that I would just like to, to add to that when you answer is, was that not given to the nation of Israel? Not to individual Jews, but that was given to the nation that it would last forever. How, how, how would you respond to that? I don't have any, uh, I don't have any issue with it. I just, uh, I have deep problems with the way in which passages such as that are used today to justify what Israel's doing as a state. And I think we must draw a big distinction between Israel in the Hebrew Scriptures, which was a monarchy, uh, life revolved around the temple, compared to today, it seeks to be a democracy, a secular state. It has uh, obviously uh, a strong religious tradition and a significant proportion of Jews are, are, are orthodox, are ultra-orthodox. Um, but I think it's problematic when we assume Israel equals Israel equals Israel. Can I just give you one example from the New Testament? Um, one of the, you know, if I was an apostle, it's probably the most embarrassing thing an apostle could ever say. On the road to Emmaus, they meet Jesus, they don't recognize him. Uh, he says, why are you looking so sad? And they say, the only one who doesn't know what's happened in Jerusalem. And he said, what? And they said, quote, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That's Luke 24, 21. Well, if Jesus wasn't redeeming Israel, I don't know what he was doing on the cross. I, I, would, but, love to, I would love to come back. I'm, I'm sitting in the middle here, but... But what they were thinking I'm not going was... To, but <laughs> what they were thinking was, he didn't fulfill our expectation and get rid of the Romans and give us back our sovereignty that we had under David and yeah. Solomon. Okay? But it was going to happen... Well, I don't think so. Okay. Because, <laughs> because I'm not gonna just before that. he's about to, you know, go, go to heaven, they say, one more question. Are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Mm. Now, Calvin in his commentary says there were more errors in that sentence than there are words. And let me just give you a clue. Um, you mean John Calvin. Who did I say? <laughs> Not Calvin Smith. Uh, sorry, just, I meant just John, Calvin. John Calvin. John Calvin. Okay. okay, John okay. Calvin. Um, you've quoted a few commentaries. The one I would recommend is uh, John Stott's commentary on Acts. In it, he says, they misunderstood the verb, the noun, and the adverb. They used the term restore in territorial terms when Jesus' answer, he did answer them in Acts 1 8. His answer in Acts 1 8 was that. Um, he would restore, it would be spiritual, not territorial. The noun Israel, having acknowledged the fact that they recognized Israel existed without the land, without the state, without the kingdom, um, they were looking for a national identity, and his mandate was for them to leave Jerusalem and take the gospel to the whole world. It would be global. And they, the adverb, at this time, they were looking for an immediate kingdom, and his would be gradual. So he answers them in Acts 1.8. It's not for you to know the times and seasons, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Jesus sent them out. In fact, in Acts 6, he had to kick them out because they still hadn't gone uh, with the persecution of Stephen. He, he sends them out from Jerusalem. He never tells them to come back. He sends them out to share the gospel with all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the earth. So he sends them out from Jerusalem. So he explodes their concept that somehow he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel, he was going to be their king ruling from, from, um, from Jerusalem. If, if they'd been there at his trial, they'd have heard him say, my kingdom is not of this world, my kingdom is from another place. But you see, Stephen, my question therefore is, you know, if, if the promises are broadened, where does it say in the Bible that it's the negation of national Israel? It doesn't say that. And, and that's the whole point, isn't it? I agree with everything you've just said, except the implication that that's the end of the story. It's not the end of the let, story. Let, let, me, let me explain I what I mean. You, it's not the end the, of the story. kingdom of God is inaugurated. It is both here and now, yep. 
but yet to come. Yep. There is a lot more to come. Yep. And if, if this is it, if we look outside in the streets of London, and this is all we've got to look forward to, well, it wasn't up to much, was it? No. So there's a lot more to come. Amen. And that's the whole point. I agree. God has not finished with Israel. I agree. God retains a plan and purpose for them as a distinct people. He can't call them, make them his, I mean, what a title, his inheritance, and then suddenly discard them. There has to be... But not separate from the vast majority of but believers we're not saying who are Gentile. separate. We've just read in Zechariah 12.10 that they will look upon him whom they have pierced. There's only one way to salvation, and that's through Christ. Yes. But we're talking about the national salvation of, uh, the, the salvation of national Israel. Now, the question, therefore, that I want to ask you is, if non-supersessionism is the biblical uh, scheme of things, if God retains a plan and purpose for the Jewish people, doesn't that demand a theological response to modern Israel? If God retains a plan and purpose for the Jewish people, past calling, future salvation, surely this demands a positive, not, not an uncritical, but a positive theological response to Israel in the Middle East where half of the world's 12 million Jewry live. How can you look at a Jewish state and say, here are... Uh, God's historical people, whether they've rejected him or not, and I, you know, not everybody in, in Israel is, is a good guy and they, they sin as much as any nation, but if they are God's historical people gathered in one place, mm -hmm. doesn't that demand a theological response that is positive towards them? Yes. Well, I'm, but I'm if I bought hear. into the eschatology of many pre-millennial dispensationalist, the last place I'd want to send my Jewish friends is Israel. But I'm not talking eschatologically. Okay. And I'm not talking about those extreme... extreme. Okay. And okay. I think we need to pin this one down, Okay, too. well, let me pin no, it no, down no, for no, you. This, let this, me pin it down for this you. This whole thing of Christian <laughs> Zionism, <laughs> this whole thing of Christian Zionism presented as a homogenous extreme right wing. No, I don't do that. I think you do. No, I don't. If I you read you my do. PhD thesis, you'd see that there's a oh, wide range well, of Well, maybe views. you've changed it by the time you got to Bloomsday. Can, can I, I just, what, would can you I respond? Yes, yes, please. Uh, but uh, we, we've used this term Christian Zionism and Christian Zionist, and um, it, it, I think it's very often seen as a political term, but isn't it actually a biblical term? that actually supports the Jewish people to return to their ancient homeland. In other words, isn't there a biblical understanding of that, not just a political one? And I think we're talking about the extremes, and I think we all accept there are extremes, but let's talk about that which is the middle road. Isn't that Christian Zionism okay. that? Yes and no. I oh, think good. I th now we know you're confused. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> sorry, denying sorry, the term sorry. Zionism can be used biblically to describe um, a Jewish national identity in the land, whether it's under David and Solomon or at some stage in the future. But I don't see it at the moment. The term Zionism, as we understand it today, and is used by most Jewish people, defines a particular political system that gives preference to Jewish people and denies those same rights to people born in the land who are not Jewish and therefore is rightly or wrongly equated with racism and apartheid and I don't want to go there tonight but they are some well, of the languages you by and then say you don't want to go well that's, that's what I mean is I'm not going to push it. it I'm just going to say that you asked me how we define Zionism yes. and it has been de has been defined in positive terms as, as the safe haven for Jewish people who've suffered persecution and, and terrible treatment at the hands of so-called Christians for hundreds of years, um, but at the same time is perpe perpetuating those tensions uh, for those who are not Jewish who live in the land. So my burden for the Jewish people today, if we're being pushed to understand what God is doing in Israel today, would be to say, if I take the prophets literally, and if you want to claim the land promises from the, the Torah, from Abraham and so on, I can't ignore the warnings of the prophets. Mm -hmm. And if I take the warnings of the prophets seriously, I would argue that we are heading for an exile from the land, not a restoration based on the official government of Israel's position vis-a-vis -vis human rights, treatment of the poor, uh, destroying homes and so on. But I don't see that as a political 
statement, I see that as trying to interpret what the prophets warn and promise to God's people. And that would apply just as much to, you know, to Britain as any other country if we were using scripture to justify our claim to the land. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, if I could respond to that. Um, I mean, I, I, I have to deal with it because you raised it. The, the whole I apartheid. I gave you a chance. Yes, uh, the, the apartheid okay. issue, and I'm not going to dwell on this. I think there's perhaps some viewers who don't realize that, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are two areas, Israel and the Palestin uh, Palestinian territories. And every time you refer to Israel being an apartheid state, I think you're given a false impression that ignores the fact that Israeli Arabs have various rights. They sit in parliament. They've had second class citizens. Uh, well, you know, um, there. Sixty uh, percent of Jewish people, Jewish Israelis, do not want to live near an Israeli Arab. Okay, but you're talking about apartheid. I've been to South Africa. Yes, so I've seen, and I've seen the effects. I think it's of worse. It. And no, I, I don't think so. I think when the you're talking, I, I think when you're talking about apartheid, you're talking about the security war. Which is called Hafrada in Hebrew, which uh -huh. means separate. But it's you're not talking words. about Abu Ghosh. Abu Ghosh is one of those towns near Jerusalem where the Arab population has a long history of oh. working with the Jews, being friendly towards the Jews. Yeah. I'm not sure if you read Hillel Cohen's book, Army of Shadows, where he looks at during the Mandate days. Yeah. There were so many people who were so much against Haj Amin Hal Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Yes. There were a lot of Arabs yeah. who want to come into covenant exactly. with Jews. That, exactly. doesn't, that doesn't sound to me like apartheid, and that's not what I've seen. No. You said it, I responded, we can Thank move you. on. And I'm sure we can discuss this in, in the future. I know you don't agree with me, but I had to say that. Second and thing. And you enjoyed doing so? No, I didn't enjoy it. I, it saddens me that we have to use strong language like apartheid. I think this debate has become way too pejorative. And I think we've all contributed to a very polemical discussion. And you know, Stephen, you and I have emailed, I want to be friends with you. I want to discuss this. My problem is, for me, Israel is not a test of orthodoxy. For me, it's a secondary issue, not, mm. not way down. Mm. I think, you know, issues of salvation, what a friend of mine once explained to me how beliefs can be compared to a series of concentric circles. Mm. The, the center circle is, is, are your tests of orthodoxy, the beliefs you would die for, what's central. Mm. The outer circle, the next circle out are things that you really feel strongly. Mm. And as you progress further yes. out, they're less important. For me, Israel is in that second circle, but you've made Israel a, a first circle issue. No, I haven't. Well, you call uh, Christian Zionists or Christian Zionism a deviant heresy. You have referred to it as another gospel. And I, I have to be honest, I think... We need to move away from that kind of language. I mean, what, what kind of Zionism are we talking about? Well, there are so many expressions of Christian yes, Zionism. Yes, definitely, definitely. I agree. And I, I, the, I, can I say, I, I think one of the issues here that, that I think comes out from, from what I read earlier on is, is this problem that you are dealing with the extremes. And are there extremes? Yes, there are. But that is not probably the norm. It's not necessarily the norm here in Britain, but I'm dealing primarily with American Christian Zionism. People like Pat Robertson, Jory Farwell, Oral Roberts, Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, John Hagee. Hagee, for example, mm -hmm. quite recently, he's pastor of a church, 20,000 member church, San Antonio, Texas, 99 million homes on a weekly basis. He said the United States must join Israel in a preemptive military strike against Iran to fulfill Bible prophecy and speed the return of Christ. This is one of the most influential Christian leaders in America calling on America to bomb Iran to bring Jesus back. Now, I see that as provocative. I, I see that as anathema in terms of, you know, Jesus has called us to be peacemakers, not widow makers. Um, I want to be on the welcoming committee, not the organizing committee. So my burden is with those elements within Christian Zionism that are treating the Jews as a third act in a four act play, to I, be frank. I, you know, I, can, I have no problems with that, and, and I think there are extremes of Christian Zionism. Yeah. But my impression, reading your blog and some of the places where you speak, uh, I, I don't get that nuance coming through. And that, that's the thing that I, you know. Well, I, you have tonight. Okay, well, that's good. That's, that's good. But Can I take you back to something you said No, let, let me finish my okay. point first. Uh, I, I don't think, for example, it is acceptable to talk about Christian Zionism in, for example, a, a country like Iran. I think there are certain settings where you should not talk about other Christians to non-Christians. 
you have this big thing about, you know, if your brother sins, speak to him mm -hmm. in private. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd be interested to know if you've ever spoken to, to Hagee in private or Pat Robertson or any of those I've people. I've spoken to friends of his. Okay, uh, well, you know, you need to speak to them. And well, we, we can't generalize, like, my wife's here, she's American. She believes God retains a plan and purpose for the Jewish people, but she's not one of those. I think that kind no. of generalization that all American Christian Zionists that. like that. I didn't say that. That is the impression. And now my question is this. Uh, I believe in a Jewish homeland. I uh, does, uh, therefore, I yeah. guess technically, I, I'm a Zionist. I believe it for theological reasons. So mm. I suppose I'm a Christian Zionist. I, I avoid the term Christian Zionist because I think you have helped to define it in, in, in uh, the way it is. I mean, mm. what, what do we mean by Christian Zionism? Is it a basic homeland like pre-mandate days? Uh, the, la the latter days of the Ottoman uh, Empire mm. when Jews could come in but they didn't have many rights. Are we talking about Jewish self-determination like there was a, a, an element of that during mandate days? Are we talking about a two-state solution, mainly Jewish state, a state free of, of anybody who's non-Jewish, a multicultural state? I think that nuance needs to come through. And I, as I say, I think the polemics need to be taken out of this. I'm, I'm guilty of, of, of a pejorative and polemical stance at times too. Mm. And when we organized our London School of Theology conference, it wasn't organized by LST, I want to get that straight, but it was, it was held there last year. One of the papers that was delivered was, the debate has got too heated. It's too heated. And now we get into this stage where people are questioning each other's uh, you know, motives. They're questioning each other's uh, salvation. And I think we need to tone it down a little bit. I and think I think that, we could okay. be productive if okay. we do. I, it's easy to, to talk in term, general terms like this. And I, I respect where you're coming from. I think that my burden is that we are heading for an apocalyptic situation in the Middle East. And um, I, my burden is for the Jewish people in Israel as much as for the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Chemical, biological, nuclear weapons are no respecter of, of race. Uh, the Middle East is too small an area for it to get out of hand. And I mean, I was in Palestine 10 days ago viewing homes being demolished, um, villages surrounded by settlements, raw effluent flowing into the village from Israeli settlements. Three o'clock every afternoon, they open the tap, out it flows, destroying the livelihoods of, of, of that particular village. Mm -hmm. um, the separation wall dividing Palestinian homes from Palestinian homes. Um, Silwan, settlers, quite extreme settlers, going in, taking over properties with their guns. Um, it's creating a, a, a very dangerous and unstable situation, both for Israelis as much as Palestinians. And therefore, I'm, my burden is, how can we diffuse that? How can we find a way forward that we'll see Jews and Palestinians living, God willing, side by side in peace? It has happened in the past, and it can happen again, as it has here in Europe. But we've, we've, got, to, we've got to hold both uh, together in our prayers and in our actions. Okay. I, I want to come back, because uh, we're nearly into time of summing up, by the way, guys. But let me uh, just uh, uh, go to uh, Gordon to get a, a few more comments that I'm sure are still flooding in. Gordon. Oh, thanks, Doug. Yeah, absolutely loads and loads of comments coming in. And uh, it's interesting, because they're not all one-sided. Uh, Karen, for instance, says, I find it extraordinary that it would appear no one seems to grasp the spiritual truth put forward by Dr. Sizer. Please listen to the word and not to some historical facts. On the other hand, uh, Amos in Kent says, folks, great program. In the end of the day, we can interpret scripture till the cows come home, but God's direct word is absolute. And he yep. says, look at Jeremiah 31, 35 to 37. Um, a number of people are asking whether there's any websites for uh, our panel that they can uh, go on to to look for some more things. So if there is, that would be very interesting. And uh, uh, here's somebody who's saying, if a kingdom or the land is spiritual, then does the panel believe that Jesus is coming back to a physical Jerusalem? That's a whole new debate for That's you. That's a whole new one, which we won't go quite there, but we'll hold that for, for, for the next one. Um, I, I, I want to br bring this down a little. First, first of all, we talked about websites. Calvin, do you, do you have a website? or? Uh, yeah, um, the first one is King's Evangelical Divinity School, www.kingsdivinity.org. We, uh, we offer degrees that are validated by University of Chester. Sorry, I've got to get the advert. Okay, in. yeah, fine. All right. uh, and and uh, we do those in 
hermeneutics, evangelical studies, graduate diploma for those who've got a degree in another subject, and also my own uh, blog, calvinlsmith.com. Okay, calvinlsmith.com, King's Finity. We'll we're get hold of these uh, and, and have them in the office, so if you don't get them now, we, we will make sure you, you, you can get them if you ring the office up. Uh, do, do, do you have one, Stephen? StephenSizer.com. That's so simple, isn't it? Why, why isn't everyone like that? Um, we're, we're about in time to, uh, to sum up, and, and I'm going to give you about four minutes each to, to do that. Um, but, uh, Stephen, could I just come, because we, we've talked about Christian Zions, we talked about the extremes, but where you see things like Iran and they are wanting to be totally anti-Semitic and destroy Israel, how, how do you respond to okay. that? Well, I've been there. Ahmadinejad has made provocative statements along those lines. But the irony is, outside Israel, the largest community of Jewish people in the Middle East is in Iran. And they've been there for that. The Arab countries. <laughs> they That's have why. been there yeah. for thousands of yes. years, and they are not all queuing up to leave. I'm just simply saying that y just as we've agreed, we mustn't use generalizations to describe Americans or Christian Zionists. The same applies to Iranians. The Iranian community in Britain, uh, I'm familiar with, and uh, I've got good contacts within the uh, within the Green Movement in Iran today, as well as. Um, the, 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 uh, the Islamic community there, uh, there is as much disagreement with Ahmadinejad and the Revolutionary Guard as there would be in, in, in Syria or in Britain. Um, Iranians need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and I've been instrumental in, in, in getting scripture into Iran and working with the church there to support the church that is suffering deeply. I recognize that. Can I just ask you one thing? I mean, just as you've said quite clearly and you've given a whole number of people in America that you totally disagree with what they're saying, would you totally disagree with what's being said by the president of Iran? Of course. You would? I've, I've critiqued him. Okay. Um, and, and as a result of that, I no longer get invited on certain programs. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Um, we're, 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 we're vast that's coming... That's good to hear. I didn't know yes, that. I, that's I, good I, to hear. Yeah. Um, how, do, do you want to just... In I'll one go anywhere to share the gospel with anyone who'll listen. In, in, in one minute... Be, <laughs> in, one, <laughs> in one minute before... I mean, how do, you resp how do you feel? Some of these other statements that really are quite provocative by some Christian groups, how, how do you respond to those? Are Calvin? you talking about extreme Christian Zionists? Yeah, yes, in that okay. sense, yes. Uh, yeah, I think some Christian Zionists are, are guilty of... Uh, of a, another form of replacement theology. They're, they're engaged in Israel olatry, a worship of Israel rather than Jesus. I think that's a very real danger. I just don't think uh, we, we, should, we should exaggerate that. I certainly don't think Christian Zionists in America, Hagee and the likes, have anywhere near the political clout that Stephen, well, I don't know if Stephen thinks that, but others certainly okay. think that. Uh, we have a lecturer at our school and, and you know, he, he specializes in US politics, and we had a discussion on that, and he doesn't think they have that much impact on American foreign policy at all. Okay, I leave it there. We're now into uh, four minutes each for summing up. Stephen, you can go first this time. Well, you've caught me unawares. Um, <laughs> I did try and warn you in my you preamble did, you, yes, just there. You did, you did, you did. <laughs> Let me sum up by repeating some of what I said earlier. Um, I found this a really illuminating debate. I appreciate Calvin very much. I've, I've been blessed by reading his material, and I've, I warm to him, and I hope we're going to have more dialogues in the future. Um, and um, so I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk. And I know that we've, we've only skirted the surface of, of, of many important scripture passages and also some of the more controversial political issues. Um, as I said, I want to be on the welcoming committee, not the organizing committee for the return of Christ. And what worries me about some elements of, if you like, the, the pro-Israel agenda is that they have a pessimistic, apocalyptic, end-time eschatology view of the future that's fatalistic, that's skeptical about peace, that really is treating the Jewish people as much as the Arabs as pawns within their, within their almost like a PlayStation game about the end of time. And I'm deeply concerned that both Jews and Muslims especially have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And, the, and, the, and, the, and for me, the most important people to achieve that are not Western evangelists coming in from the outside. It's Messianic believers and Palestinian Christians. And therefore, I hope programs like this will motivate listeners to get behind those works in Israel-Palestine that are bringing Christians together, Messianic and Palestinian, praying for them, uh, working for reconciliation, because they are the glue. It's the, it's the believers who have a ministry of reconciliation, not confrontation or retaliation. It, Judaism and Islam do not have a really well-honed concept of reconciliation that we find in the gospel, uh, where we're called to be peacemakers, not widow makers. So my hope is that we will really get behind people like Musalaha uh, and other, other projects which brings Messianic and Palestinian believers together because they need our prayers, they need our support if they are to continue to exist in that land. Okay. That's my prayer. Thank you, Steve. Calvin. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been, uh, it's been fascinating. Thank I never thought an hour and a half, which I was terrified about, would go so quickly. <laughs> Uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you, it really has, and I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, uh, I know some people on the pro-Israel side have criticized you, but I see you as a genuine brother in Christ. I just disagree with a lot of the things that, 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 that you say, and I think I'd like to dialogue with you some more. In conclusion, I'd just like to say, I, I think the scriptures teach that God hasn't finished with Israel. They're the apple of his eye, uh, despite the fact that, you know, they sin. Uh, one day, I believe, national Israel will be saved, and this inevitably has a bearing on how we view a Jewish state that comprises half of the, the world's Jewry. I don't believe Christian Zionism is a heresy, uh, and I think that we need to be careful with, with language like that. Uh, I want to have fellowship with Stephen. I respect him deeply, and my hope and prayer is that the future debate becomes less pejorative. I, I certainly, from my point of view, will do my hardest and seek to please the Lord by not being uh, confrontational and unnecessarily prickly, if I can put it that way. And I hope that tonight we've gone some way to doing that. I mean, we, you know, we disagree with each other, but I, I feel no animosity towards you. I feel quite the opposite. Uh, and so my hope and prayer is that uh, as we finish this up, we all pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Jerusalem yes. that we learn the facts of what's going on and, and, and be careful to present the facts accurately, that we focus on reconciling believers on both sides. I believe we should support Israel and pray for her as a nation that God, not necessarily, I'm not talking about the political nation, I'm talking about the Jewish people, but I also think we should develop and proclaim God's plans for the Arabs. And I think some extremes within Christian Zionism have not done that. They need the Lord just as much as the Jews need the Lord. I think we should eschew an Israel right or wrong position, but that doesn't mean we replace it with an Israel is always wrong. Mm -hmm. I think let's avoid the polemics, the pejorative, pejorative nature of the debate. Let it not become a divisive issue in the church. It could be an exciting thing that as Christians we could discuss and we could learn from each other. So, uh, and to viewers, I would say, get into your Bibles mm -hmm. and learn about this because a lot of the problems on both sides is because of biblical ignorance. Mm -hmm. yes. Has, has, has anything been said tonight you're going to go away and say, I must think about that a bit more, look at, into that more? Uh, I think one of the things that Stephen has raised, which I have some knowledge of, but I'm sure he has more because he spends more time in the Palestinian territories than I do, is some of the, the issues that everyday Palestinian people go through. I understand a lot of that is for security issues. I also don't agree with everything that Israel does. I would like to know more about that. I would like the opportunity to see some of those things more myself. At the same time, I, you know, I, I would hope that perhaps Stephen would be a little bit more open-minded towards some of the fears and concerns that Christian Zionists have when it comes to uh, Israel's security. Okay. Uh, Stephen, for you, is there anything you're going to take away from tonight and say, I must look at that? I'm going to get to know Calvin for a start. That's I know good. we've got a big conference coming up in um, March next year in Bethlehem Christ at the checkpoint and we're really delighted we've got people like Richard Harvey coming and some of the Messianic leaders from Jerusalem speaking and so it's going to give us an opportunity to engage Messianic believers and uh, Palestinian believers together. I'm really looking forward to that mm. and learning from them. 
Great. Look, thank you both thank you very much for being here and, and, and for sharing. Thank you, audience, for being here. I'm sorry we didn't take more questions for you, but really do appreciate uh, you, uh, you being here. Um, thank you, viewers, for all that, uh, that, that, that you have done in contribution. I know hundreds of emails. You're all sitting there saying there, why didn't he read my one out? But I can assure you we've done as much as uh, we can in the hour and a half. Whether we do more, we will see from, uh, from that point of view. But what we do, I, I just want to really underline what Calvin said, and I, I know what Stephen feels as well, and that is that we really begin to get back into our scriptures. Let's look at these things. L let, let's look at what God is saying. What is the whole thing with Romans chapter 11? Stephen said one thing, Calvin said another. What is that? Get back to understand what you are saying and what the Lord is saying. Get back into your scriptures. Find out for yourself. It's been great to have you with us. I enjoy these times. May the Lord really bless you and give you his peace at this time. Bye for now.